I'm going to open up with a word of prayer, all right? Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for your goodness. Father, we thank you for your words for us. We thank you for your will toward us, your thoughts toward us, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. Thoughts to prosper us and give us an expected end. God, you are a good God, and we know that. We praise you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. And they all said, Amen. 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 Take your Bibles. Let's go to Exodus chapter 15. So I also learned, I learned at this uh, break that we just recently had, that uh, God is also Cuban. So I'm getting into Jehovah Rapha, and that is the Lord that heals. And our, our very own Cuban here, his middle name is Raphael, which is L for God and Rafa for heals. Man, God. He loves us all the same. All right. Right. He even loves Cubans. <laughs> so Exodus chapter 15, verse 26, it says, And said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that heals you. This word, uh, the Lord that healeth, that's Jehovah Rapha. These are redemptive names of God. And uh, the Lord that heals, this word Rapha in the Hebrew for heal is translated a couple different ways in English. One is heal, of course. Another one is cure. Another one is restore. Another one is repair. And last but not least is physician. And so what it's saying is the Lord, my restorer, the Lord, my repairer. The Lord, my healer, my curer, and the Lord, my doctor. The Lord, my physician. All right? And so, uh, obviously, God is the Lord that heals. He loves us. And uh, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, the central themes of both of them are the act of redemption. In the New Testament, the central theme of redemption, or the act of redemption, is Jesus Christ redeeming us from sin and bondage, obviously. But in the Old Testament, it's redemption from Egypt as a type of Jesus Christ's work. And it's interesting here, because Exodus chapter 15 is the first thing that God establishes right after redemption. Exodus 14 is them coming through the big walls of the Red Sea. And so God establishes something very, very quickly, very swiftly, and he establishes it with a lot of authority. I have redeemed you, and I will heal you. I will heal you. Obviously, in the Passover meal for uh, the Old Testament, I'm sure you folks know about it, the Passover meal when they were about to get all the children of Israel out of Egypt, they all had the Passover meal, and they, they ate the lamb, and this lamb, lamb is an archetype for, or for Christ, right? And it said um, all of them, which we think is... Uh, is uh, a conservative estimate is about 2 million Jews. All of them ate of the Passover meal and not one knee was feeble among them. It doesn't matter if you're a child, doesn't matter if you're an old person, doesn't matter if you're a middle age, doesn't matter if you're overweight, underweight, doesn't matter if you're sick or not. Every single one of the children of Israel came out of Egypt without feeble knees. All of them strengthened, all of them in good health. And why, why did they do that? Because they had the Passover meal, and that Passover meal pointed to something, right? And what did that Passover meal point to? Jesus. Pointed to what Jesus Christ was going to do. And then, boom, big central theme of the Old Testament, an act of redemption, pulling them out of the sin and bondage of Egypt, out of slavery. And then the first thing that God establishes is here. Exodus 15, I am the Lord that heals you. Pretty cool, huh? Let's look at a couple other things. Let's just, because uh, we just want to get corroborating information. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 7. And in Deuteronomy chapter 7, it says in verse 12, Wherefore it shall come to pass, if you hearken to these judgments, and do them, and the Lord thy God shall keep unto thee the covenant and the mercy which he sware unto thy fathers. Verse 15. And the Lord will take away from thee, what? All sickness, and will put none of the evil diseases of Egypt, which thou knowest, upon thee, but will lay them upon all that what? Hate thee. How many of you know that God fights for his people? Right? God fights for his people. 
He fights hard for his people. It says, everything that happened in Egypt, I'm going to make that happen to your enemies. Follow me, and I will take all sickness away from you. And this is a very interesting Hebrew word for all. It means all. <laughs> it's a very sophisticated word study. <laughs> it means every single one. Let's go to uh, Exodus 23. And in Exodus 23, it says in verse 25, And ye shall serve the Lord your God, and he will bless thy bread, and bless thy water, and I will take sickness away from the midst of thee. There shall nothing cast their young, nor be barren in thy land, and the number of thy days I will fulfill. This is God just over and over telling him, I'm the doctor. I'm the physician. All right? You might get a bad report from your doctor. Go seek a second opinion. Okay? Seek the second opinion of the physician who counts, and that's God. I will be your physician. I will be your doctor. I will be your repairer, your restorer. And this is Old Testament. And you, and you could tell, like, like, you know, we kind of get hindsight as 2020 because we look at, we're looking at it from a New Testament perspective, right? And you can, you can almost anticipate God's heart. He's like, they have no idea what I'm about to do. They have no idea that the level of righteousness, the level of availability, accessibility, the level of healing that's going to be available to them. They have no idea. It's like you can read the Old Testament in light of that. Who's talking to you, Joe, when you were talking about uh, seeing Christ everywhere in the Bible, right? And God is setting up a theme, and he's setting up a purpose and an intention. And it's good to know God's intention. It's good to know God's heart of love and his, God's heart and his disposition of his heart toward us. Because when you are convinced of God's heart toward you, you will receive what he's promised toward you. Because if you are not convinced of God's heart toward you, if you're not convinced of his intention, his motive, and his disposition of favor, you'll stand afar off. You might read the word, but you'll be like, hey, but there wouldn't, won't be intimacy. It's because I understand his intentions and his hearts toward me that I can really step in and apprehend and app appropriate his grace. It's because I'm 100% convinced that he completely loves me. I'm 100% convinced that he is for me, not against me. And he, shows Jesus, he gives Jesus Christ as a demonstration of that heart. Let's go to, uh, this is going to be a backwards way to kind of to come at this. But uh, first let's go to John chapter 10. And this is a verse that you all know. but it is worth keeping in the forefront of our minds. Aaron talked about this in his teaching. And he said in John chapter 10, verse 10, The thief comes not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. Now this is saying something, because it's saying that your enemy has a singular purpose. He comes not but for to only, only do these things. Only steal, only kill, only destroy. That's the only reason he's lurking, all right? So we have, to be, we have to be cognizant of this so that we can be on guard. Because if we see any hint of him, we understand what that intention is, right? But Jesus Christ has come that we might have life and that we would have it Thanking you very much that you might have it more abundantly. We got a smart bunch here, so let's uh, let's start this, and we're gonna we're gonna look at communion first, and we're gonna actually go through a pretty controversial record because of the way that people have handled it in the past. But I want you to see some really really cool things in it. Let's go to First Corinthians chapter eleven. And 1 Corinthians chapter 11, let's start in verse 24. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. 
This do in remembrance of me. Now, here in this section, Paul is addressing them while they're coming together for the communion meal, and he's addressing them in a sense out of reproof because they're doing it a, a lot of different ways. Guys are coming, they're getting drunk off the communion wine. People are not waiting their turn to eat the meal. Some people are just coming there for the meal to eat because they're hungry. They're not coming actually for a memorial. And so Paul is saying, okay, let's go back to basics. Let's see what this is actually really about, okay? So he takes them to... Um, the gospel records, and he says what Jesus Christ said at the Last Supper. And when he had given thanks, verse 24, he break it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as oft as ye drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. That's a pretty, pretty harsh statement there. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eats and drinks unworthily eats and drinks damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep." For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Now, this sounds like a pretty uh, sobering section, huh? Because it seems to indicate that for this cause, drinking unworthily, many are sick. Many are feeble, and some sleep, which means some die. But what is drinking unworthily? not discerning the Lord's body. Now this means something here, because he talks about the wine, the cup of wine, which is re reminiscent of the blood. It talks about the bread, which is reminiscent of the body. But here he doesn't say the person doesn't drink unworthily or take unworthily because they don't discern the blood. He says he doesn't discern the body. Now why doesn't he discern the body? And what happens as a result of not discerning Jesus Christ's body? Well, for this case, people are sick. People are feeble. Some people die. And the implication here is die prematurely because they don't discern the Lord's body. And the word discern means to understand. They don't understand what the Lord's body is for. Turn to Isaiah chapter 53. Some people have handled that section saying, God inflicts sickness on people who don't get it right. And they haven't learned how to navigate that section of scripture. And in some cases, if you're reading it without paying attention, I can understand why they think it like that. But the proof is in the point, of, and the point is the undiscerning of Christ's body. So what we're going to do is we're going to understand Christ's body. How many of us are Christians? You'll understand the blood, right? The blood's for what? Remission of sins, forgiveness. What's the body for? Isaiah 53. Verse 4. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. So this is interesting because these words here are very interesting words. Verse 4 says, Surely he hath borne our griefs. And that's the Hebrew word kali. And everywhere that it's used, I think it's used about 27 times in the Bible, all right, this Hebrew word. And 23 of those usages is sicknesses and diseases. So he hath borne our what? Sicknesses and diseases, okay, and carried our sorrows. This is another interesting Hebrew word. It's the word makab, and it's used uh, probably about 16 times in, in the Old Testament, and it's used in sorrow in some places to represent mental pain. And then in other places, it's rendered in the English just as pain when it's representative of physical pain because makab, the Hebrew word, means mental and physical pain. So what is this section saying? It's saying, surely he hath borne our griefs, 
our sicknesses and diseases and carried our mental and physical pain. Yet we esteemed him stricken, like he was afflicted, like he was punished of God, smitten of God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. Let's go to uh, Matthew chapter 8, because you need to, I want you to see more corroboration of this, especially the point of surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Let's go to Matthew chapter 18, or Matthew chapter 8, I'm sorry. And in Matthew chapter 8, let's uh, see Jesus in action in verse 14. And when Jesus was coming to Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid and sick of a fever. And he touched her hand and the fever left her. Now, back in the day, fevers were really, fevers were really ominous back in the day. They didn't have as much, you know, medical whatever that we have today. So a fever could be a cold or it could be something life-threatening, okay? So a fever was, was very ominous to them. It was like, you know, it could go either way for them just because of, you know, the level of understanding they had medically at that time. So his wife's mother laid uh, sick of a fever, and he touched her, and the fever left her, and she arose and ministered unto them. When the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all all that were sick. Really, really interesting Greek word. Guess what it means? <laughs> the sharp crowd. <laughs> means all, every single one that was sick. That it might be fulfilled. Now pay attention. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. This is talking about Isaiah 53 verse 4, saying he himself bore our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. This is the corroboration for Isaiah 53 verse 4. Griefs is sicknesses and diseases. Infirmities is uh, mental and physical pain. And that's an interesting thing, too, because, uh, you know, I've, I've met people uh, when ministering healing to people, and they'll say, well, I'm not sick, but I just got a lot of pain. I'm achy. I'm like, well, that's paid for, too, <laughs> you know. <laughs> because, you know, the, the flesh and people have a really, have a really kind of, uh, they like do acrobatics with this idea of healing. It's like, he'll take all my sicknesses and diseases, but I have to reserve some pain for myself. It can't be that good, right? <laughs> no, it's that good. <laughs> Let's go back to Isaiah chapter 53. I should have told you to keep your, uh, your, your hand there. And in Isaiah 53, we'll take it from verse 4 again. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Surely he has borne our sicknesses and diseases and carried both our mental and physical pain. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement of our peace was upon him. Um, this is interesting because in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, when I went through uh, that communion record that we were going through, it talks about the chastening of the Lord afterwards. It says like, and for this reason, you're chastened. And people have thought that, oh, the chastening is the God making you sick and putting you to death because you get communion wrong rather than discerning the Lord's body. So go to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Aaron hit this section uh, earlier today in the Lord, the shepherd. So we're going to go a little bit over what he said, but we're going to start in verse 1 in Deuteronomy chapter 8. And it said, All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do, and that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord sware unto your fathers. Thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee, to prove thee, 
to know what was in thy heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger, fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not. Neither did thy fathers know that he might make thee know that man does not live by bread alone, physical bread, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Thy raiment waxed not old upon thee, neither did thy foot swell these forty years. Verse 5 is what I want you to pay attention to. Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chastens his son, so the Lord thy God, what? Chastens thee. Now this is the point. Does a father, a good father, chase his son by making him sick and killing him? No. Right? And if you, really want, if you really wanted to go down that rabbit hole, you could say one person, to bring up just a point of a, you know, playing devil's advocate, and I mean that both as a pun and literally, you could say, well, what about Jesus, right? Because God put sickness on him, and he died, and he gave up his life. Maybe that's the same chastisement. But God didn't chasten Jesus like a son, did he? No. Jesus got our chastening. Jesus got the chastening of a sinner, not a son. How are you going to chasten a son that never did anything wrong? Right? You get where I'm going with this? The chastisement for our peace. The punishment for our peace. You know what that word peace is there? Shalom. It's shalom. Jehovah shalom. Now, let me give you a little, uh, let me, it's the word shalom. Look it up. Yeah. You're all smart. Look it up. You've been answering the questions great all day. <laughs> it's the word shalom, the chastisement of our shalom. Now, what does that mean? The chastisement of our peace. Let me give you the, let me give you the definition of the word shalom, okay? It's, uh, okay, where, where are you? Okay, so shalom is Completeness, soundness, welfare, peace, safety, health, prosperity, quiet, tranquility, contentment, and friendship and covenant with God. That's shalom. The chastisement that purchased our prosperity, peace, quiet, tranquility, friendship with God was put on Jesus. Because Jesus was not chastised as a son. He was chastised in my place as a sinner. So that I can get chastening like a son. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Oh, my God. Doesn't that make it? I mean, because the correction of the Lord, the chastening of the Lord is for our benefit. God doesn't, is not a tyrannical father who beats his kids, makes them sick, and kills them. <laughs> Jesus Christ took that in our place as the punishment of a righteous judge on a sinner, which is what God needs to be, a righteous judge. But Jesus Christ took our place as a substitute. His son that did nothing wrong identified with us through the cross. Identified with our. You, you know, you ever heard that? I don't know how I can identify with Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. He never identified with you. Look no further than the chastisement of a sinner on a perfect son. He took it so that we could have prosperity, peace, health, tranquility, friendship with God all over in that reference of shalom. I mean, goodness, hallelujah, God, oh my goodness. Now, doesn't this just blow your mind? And I understand why in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 about communion, people get it wrong, right? Because in that section, it doesn't tell you what the body represents. It just says, break the body and eat it in remembrance of me. That's why you need to know the word of God. You need to know God's promises. You need to know what the body represents because the body represents physical healing for every believer. It represents Christ's work. Not, so Jehovah Sid Canoe, let me, let me tell you, okay? Jehovah Sid Canoe, righteousness, is God's provision for the deliverance of our soul. That's what the name means. Jehovah Rapha is God's provision for the deliverance of our body. That's the difference, okay? I'm getting excited up here. <laughs> Jesus paid for so much more than our ticket to heaven. Way more. Way more. Uh, <laughs> you've probably heard of this. It's an inappropriate college habit. It's called streaking. And it's when people party too hard and they unclothe themselves and run through the streets naked in public. Okay? And you're probably wondering, what are you about to say? <laughs> 
What I'm trying to say is donning just the helmet of salvation and nothing else makes you a streaking Christian. <laughs> Do not be streaking Christians. We're not supposed to be streaking Christians. I got a breastplate on. I got a, I got a belt on that holds up something else that covers something else. <laughs> Hallelujah. But there are too many Christians today walking around with the, knowing the blood, but not discerning the body. Do you understand? Not discerning the body. I'm preaching up here. <laughs> he carried our pains and our sicknesses. So there's no sense in both of us, both of you carrying it. He paid for it. God is the best insurance program. Everybody wants universal health care. Christians got it, all right? And it's not, and the payment's paid in full, all right? It's the greatest insurance program, all right? You have the greatest medicine. The side effects are all good. You know, how about like righteousness and peace? Those are great side effects of medication, right? You ever seen like the stomach pain medication where the side effect is stomach pain? What? <laughs> like, you ever see the, what, that makes no sense. <laughs> There's no copay. No copay. Jesus, pay, Jesus Christ paid the copay. Like, it's, we're all good. But Christians are still trying to pay the copay. And they're trying to pay it in how much you pray and how much you fast and how righteous you are and, how, and your actions, how many people you bring to fellowship. How many chapters do you read a day? It's not attendant on any of those. It's attendant on work that's already done. The chastisement of my peace is already paid for. I already have shalom. You know, whenever I get off the phone, I always say peace. And when I start saying shalom, it's way better. It's like, I can say, you know, soundness, quality of life and health and all that stuff with one word. It's, are we really going to start to believe that our healing depends on our own works rather than his? There's too many Christians trying to pay for their healing through good behavior. That somehow I've become a super apostle enough and I've worked my way up the spiritual ranks to merit myself a healing. I deserve this healing. Look how great I've been. You don't do that with salvation. It is a gift. Salvation is a gift, right? What do you say in, in reference to salvation? And a gift. Thank you, right? You don't say, oh, well, what I owe you. I'll, I'll hit you back, right? <laughs> no, nah, I'll, I'll, I'll hit you back. Don't worry. I'll, I'll make, we'll, be, we'll be square. No, you don't say that with salvation, do you? What do you say with healing? Thank you. It's a gift. Thank you, Father. You're awesome. Thank you. I receive it in the name of Jesus Christ. I discern the body. I understand. Third John 2 says, God wants us to prosper and be in good health even as thy soul prospers, which means prosperity comes from the inside out. I want you to prosper on the outside even as, according to, thy soul prospers. Right? Let's go to uh, Psalm 103. Psalms is a great place because most of the very explicit sections about, like, I cried out to the Lord and he healed me. You know, those, like, great one sentence, like, there was a conflict and now it's resolved. Hallelujah. Those are a lot of those are in the Psalms. And I think a lot of those are in the Psalms because what should healing garner? What should be the byproduct of healing in our attitudes and our disposition? Praise should be the product of it, right? It should be hallelujah, thank you, God. Thank you for your wonderful gift. You are awesome. Thank you, God. That should be it. And that's why you find it a lot of times in, in the Psalms. Psalm 103. Let's start from verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O my soul. And all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forgot not all his benefits. It's great. It doesn't tell you to remember all his benefits because it's impossible. There's too much. But just don't forget them all. Right? Verse 3, for who forgives all thine iniquities, who heals all thy diseases. Now, you're Christians, right? 
We, we believe that God has forgiven all our iniquities, right? So just as surely as Jesus Christ spilled his blood so that you could have remission of sins, his body was battered and bruised so that your body could be physically whole. It's the same level. Forgiveness and healing are always associated together. It's the same thing. But there are many Christians who have difficulty receiving healing or ministering healing because of this weird elitist idea that the super abundant super apostles are the only ones out there healing people or are the only ones worthy of healing. Whereas God doesn't do that. He says, "Mm mm-mm, Jesus Christ paid for your sins and he's paid for your health. Those are the two things. Immediately after the act of redemption in Isaiah 53, right? Uh, Or at least the prophetic announcement of it. What does he say? He says, and health. Immediately after the children go through the act of redemption in the Old Testament, what does God immediately establish? I'm the Lord that heals. See, God is not separating your forgiveness from sins and your deliverance of your soul from the deliverance of your body. He's saying these are in tandem. It's a package deal. The package deal. All right. Take your Bibles. Let's go to, uh, where's my note? Psalm 107. Psalm 107, verse 20. Somebody else hit this. I think it was Joe. It's worth repeating. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. Where the word goes, healing should be. Right? And this is in a, remember, this is not just physical. It's deliverance from your mental and your physical pain, right? Because he, he carried those two. So I carried sickness and disease and mental and physical pain. Let's corroborate that with Psalms 147. Go there. Psalm 147, verse 3. Is that the right one? Yes, he heals the broken in heart and binds up their wound. Now, this one for me is personal because before I ever ministered healing or received a ministering of physical healing, God one-on-one repaired my heart. And I used that as a logical stepping stone. I said, God, if you can heal my heart, then a foot out of joint is nothing. If you can heal my heart, then cancer is jack. If you can heal my heart, then any disease, any physical infirmity is way, on, uh, to me, they're on a lower scale than heartbrokenness. Sickness on the inside of the inner man is way more detrimental to a person's health than I think physical ailments are. And if God can heal a broken heart, then the other stuff's easy to me. That's just how I received it. Now, if God can heal your heart, then obviously he can heal your knee, right? <laughs> <laughs> now let's see um, let's go back to Isaiah 53 let's point something out Isaiah 53 Verse 5, but he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. Awesome. Tiffy, do you have your phone Bible on you? Can you turn to Isaiah 53, verse uh, 4 and 5 in the NLT? I'm going to go to the Amplified because I just think these, they just, you know, you, you hear it and you hear it, and these are just wonderful ways to say it. So in Isaiah 53, Verse 5, I'm going to read to you from the Amplified. It says, But in fact, he has borne our our griefs and he has carried our sorrows and pains, yet we ignorantly assumed that he was the one stricken. 
<laughs> struck down by God and degraded and humiliated by him. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our wickedness, our wickedness, our sin, our injustice, our wrongdoing. The punishment required for our well-being, shalom, fell on him. And by his stripes, his wounds, we are, present tense, healed. Not we will be healed. Now, this obviously is a prophetic section. It's talking about a time to come when Jesus Christ comes, but it's saying it in the present tense to add emphasis, right? We are healed now in the prophetic announcement of Isaiah 53. Uh, Tiffy, can you read uh, Isaiah 53 verses 4 and 5 loudly, please, in the New Living Translation? Yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins, but he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. Awesome. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we can be healed. Do you see the exchange happening here? His blood spilled for our sins, his body beaten so that ours doesn't get beaten. Do you see? His body broken, his body whipped and scarred, and by his stripes, mine retains divine health in the name of Jesus Christ. Okay? That's the idea here. Okay, and so now in reference to Isaiah 53, go to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. As surely as you are born again, and as surely as you are going to heaven, that is the same type of availability for you to walk in divine health to walk in divine healing. The interesting about 1 Corinthians chapter 11, when the controversy is there, it, it seems to indicate that these people are getting sick and feeble and they're dying prematurely because they don't understand the word of the Lord. What if God has divine healing in your life so that you can actually not die prematurely, but live your whole life through in the way that he has it for the works he's prepared for you so you can do the things that he's called you to do because you're going to need energy and stamina to walk the walk with God. You're going to need health and exuberance to walk the walk with God. You're going to need to be able to not get sick everywhere you go, not have to suffer jet lag all the time, not have to do all these things. You're going to have to be able to access these things in a supernatural level to do the supernatural thing, which is walk with God. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24 says, Who his own self bear, bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye what? Were healed. Now this is interesting because this is in the past tense now. In Isaiah it was you are healed. And in 1 Peter is you were healed. Why? Because your healing's purchased for you already. It's already been purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ, by the body of Jesus Christ. The will call window of God is open to receive the healing. The payment's already made. We don't have to pay for it in extra prayers and stuff like that. Now, I'm not knocking prayer. I hope you know that. <laughs> but the, the will call window is open. You were healed by Jesus Christ's stripes. It's already paid for. We just have to walk in the revelation and the reality and the knowing of it. That's why sickness is an illegal intruder in the believer. You are the temple of God. And if there's anything other there that's not supposed to be there, that sucker gets evicted in the name of Jesus Christ. That's both devil spirits and that's sickness. That's Jesus Christ. That's the Great Commission, right? That's the Great Commission. Go forth, preach the gospel, right, the word. Go out and cast out devil spirits. Heal them that are sick. Raise the dead. Which means if you walk up, you have more authority than whatever is in that body in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, apart from Christ, you ain't got no authority. Right? And apart from God, Jesus Christ knew that, that that was the same deal. He says, of myself, I can do nothing. And of ourselves, we can do nothing. But we're not just of ourselves. If you're walking with God, you are meant to be a conduit, not a container. Do you see what I'm saying? You are a conduit for the Holy Spirit. It's supposed to flow through you. You're supposed to operate it. It's supposed to look like Jesus. It kind of looks like Jesus if you start casting out devil spirits and you start healing the sick, right? And these signs will follow them that believe. What are those signs? Signs, miracles, wonders. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Right? 
Go to Acts chapter 10. Acts 10.37 says, That word I say you know, <laughs> and you know it too, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And Jesus Christ was made manifest to destroy the works of the devil. That's what it says. And it doesn't say that they're oppressed of the Father. You see how tricky it is? If somebody thinks that sickness comes from God, then they'll be completely disarmed to be able to kick it out or get healing. Why? Because they're walking in God's will. That means the people who are in the hospital who are dealing with stuff and they are unlearned in the ways of God's word are dealing with an enemy who they think has the characteristics of God or the other way around. Dealing with a God who thinks they have the characteristics of the enemy. So the enemy doesn't want you to know these truths because then you'll settle for sickness. He doesn't want you to know these truths because then you'll settle for anything less than perfect divine health. But if you discern the Lord's body, well then there, there, don't, there doesn't need to be many sick, many feeble, and then some that, some that sleep. It is accounted unto every man to die. It is. But you don't have to go out in sickness. It is not accounted to every man to die in sickness and in hurt and to something breaks and then all of a sudden you go. Who's, what verse is that? <laughs> the redemptive name Jehovah Sidkenu reveals God's redemptive provision of our souls. The redemptive name Jehovah Rapha reveals God's redemptive provision for our bodies. You know, Jesus Christ was the Word made flesh. And it's, he was the Word come to life. He was completely embodied in it. And what did he do? He preached the gospel. He had a great relationship with God. He walked in great health. And then he kicked disease and sickness out of other people. Now, God is calling us to imitate him and be like Jesus Christ which means that as you start to put this on in your heart and in your mind and let this develop and run through you, you'll start looking like the Word made flesh. That's the idea. And the Word made flesh goes out, preaches the gospel of the kingdom, preaches the good news concerning Jesus Christ, raises the dead, puts hands on people, and they shall recover. I'm going to go through a couple of... Uh, what do you call a uh, couple of popular questions for people who are um, curious about ministering healing or receiving healing. Some of these are just kind of like uh, what I can discern as a popular stumbling blocks or questions that people might have about healing. One is, I know I have my healing, but why do I still have flare ups? Right. Oftentimes, that is the enemy coming to steal. Because the enemy can't steal something from you that doesn't belong to you. If you come to my house and try to steal a million dollars, I guarantee you won't get it. <laughs> Why won't you get it? I, I don't have a million dollars. <laughs> Not yet. In the name of Jesus. But he can't, but health is yours legally. It's yours. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So people have had symptomatic flare ups, and it says in the book of James, it says, resist the devil and he shall flee. You know, if you do not resist, he is under no obligation to have to flee. But if you do resist, which means fight, he's got to go, right? And some people, I've seen it, they'll come, they'll get ministered to, they'll get delivered. And then the next day, they'll call me with a symptom, and they'll crumple like newspaper under that symptom. And I'm like, dude, 
We ain't in heaven yet. This is not the utopia. You understand that there's a fight down here. We're soldiers at the same time as we're sons, right? Resist the devil and he will flee. It takes, it takes understanding your identity and then standing on it and not moving. And of course, everybody's growing in different, le time, different levels of development with this, right? We all are kind of growing up in this. But uh, oftentimes what the enemy wants to try and do is try to touch with a symptom to get your faith to, to die out and then get you to crumple like newspaper and then it gets you to stop resisting him and then he doesn't have to go nowhere. Uh, how about this question? I've ministered healing to someone else and they've got healed, yet I've manifested complete Yes, yet I've not manifested complete healing in my own body. What gives? <laughs> Anybody been there? Oftentimes it's easier to believe for someone else healing rather than our own because we're usually most critical and sin conscious of ourselves, not the other person. So there's more natural unbelief that you have to overcome, that you have to combat, and it's a trick of the enemy. See, knowing Christ and his righteousness his righteousness, not your own, his righteousness, knowing that he has been, that, and that that righteousness has been conferred to you through him in the new birth is key. You are righteous. This sucker is an illegal intruder. Kick him out. Don't ever think that if you yourself are not completely healed right now, this also disqualifies you from being able to minister to somebody else. You ever, you ever thought that? And it's really, it's really a stupid thought. The idea is I need to be like really perfectly healed and whole in order to be able to minister healing to somebody else. Have you ever thought to yourself, I have to be perfectly sinless before I preach the good news concerning Jesus Christ's sin, remission of sins? I mean, that is completely backwards, isn't it? If we waited for that, we would never be good enough to minister healing. Or we would never be good enough to preach the gospel. Um, I heard a story of a, of a blind girl who went on a mission trip, and she uh, ministered to another blind girl. And uh, I just thought that was so awesome. She ministered healing to another blind girl, and in her ministering to the other blind girl, they both got healed. Wow. Praise God. The thing is, as God flows through you, He's infinite. His ways are perfect. He's that strong. As He flows through you, there's plenty left over for you, Okay. <laughs> It's not our power that heals. It's God in Christ flowing through us. If you're sick, I recommend that you find someone to lay hands on and minister to. It's like stomping on the devil's head. And the power of God flows through you. There's plenty left over for yourself. Jesus did not come so that we could manage our sickness, manage our disease, manage our pain, manage our depression, manage our anxiety. He came to carry it away. You don't need to take a pill every day. You can take the gospel pill. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I'm keeping that. All right. I took that from Andrew Womack. I wish I could say I took that, but I did not. You don't need to take a pill every day. Imagine if you took the gospel three times a day with water, right? Took it three times a day with food and with water. Watch what, imagine what would happen, right? I mean, like, what would happen to your life? And, like, really taking it into you. Not, not, not this, like, not, yeah, not going through the motions. Not, I got checked, got my chapter. Don't know what it was. Just finished. Whatever, you know. <laughs> When you take time meditating in his word, it will bring transformation out of the word and into you. That's the idea. All right? When you were born again, you were given a new heart. That's what God says. He says, I will give them a new heart, not one of, of, of stone, but one of flesh. You've been given a new heart in the new birth. What you have not been given is a new brain. That's why you need mind renewal. This is why we need to read the word. Because you have a new heart, but you need to learn how to lead that heart. You need to learn how to guide that heart with Scripture. That's why you've been given the Word of God and given it to renew your mind, to lead that new heart you've received. Okay? What else? Hmm. 
Don't conform to the way the world views anxiety and sickness. Instead, let the word of God transform you to the way that he sees you. Paid for, healed, cast out, defeated. Honestly, what other alternative do you have? What other alternative is there? Well, you're going to roll the dice on doctors, and nothing against doctors. Doctors are great. God has used doctors greatly in the world to bring great healing to the world, I believe. But always get a second opinion. It's Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, your doctor. He's the best doctor. 1 John 4, 17. Let's go there. Drawing to a close. Verse John 4, 17. Herein is our love made perfect, meaning mature, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in the next world. <laughs> no, this world. There is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear, because fear has torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. You know why God doesn't want us to have fear in our lives? Because he doesn't want us to be in torment. And sickness brings people torment because usually on the heels of sickness or on the heels of a doctor's report and on the heels of something like that, fear sets in on a lot of people. But it's perfect love that casts that out. That's why when we go, like I, I liked what you said, Joe, when we go out and we're ministering to people, I'm not trying to get you to come to my fellowship. I want you to know God. You come to my fellowship, you will, but I'm not saying that's the only way to do it. How can I love you? What are your needs? Oh, you want to come? Sure. John 14, 12, you don't need to turn there. It says, whoever believes on me will do all my works and will do greater. Matthew 16, 17 through 18 says, these signs shall follow them that believe, not them that study only. We're not waiting for God to show up. He's waiting for us. The work is already done in, cre in Christ. Healing is available now. All right? Um, I had a lot of other things I wanted to share with you, but I think that's good enough for now. And so what we're going to do is we're going to close up here. We're going to make ministering available. If you have anything, now, now remember, if you have anything, there's one verse that, uh, that uh, Pete, you went to in uh, Isaiah or Jeremiah. God said, I create the fruit of the lips. And I think that is so awesome because sometimes it takes somebody ministering to you and speaking to whatever the, whatever the heck is going on in order for God to create the fruit of those lips. So the confession needs to be good. Uh, our salvation is based on the confession of our mouth and the work of faith in our hearts. Um, and so we're going to have a ministering uh, seg uh, segment here in a little bit. And so if you need ministering for anything, now it doesn't have to just be physical, all right? Remember, he's carried our mental pains and our physical pains, right? So I have been in instances where people have come up and just said, hey, I'm having nightmares. Can you pray for me? Or, you know, things, or... Or I just want you to pray for me. If you just want prayer, like we're just here for you. Uh, we're going to be situated over there in that area. Um, come and be ministered to. If you're interested in ministering, come and watch. Or uh, if you're next to me and somebody comes up to me, I might pull you in, whatever. But this is a place to get a need met. This is part of what we're called to do. Is we're called to stand out on that ledge of faith, lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Now, the one thing I want to bring to mind on all this is this is not a power encounter. This is a truth encounter, okay? Light and darkness don't have a power struggle if I turn off that light right there. If I come in and this place is dark and I flip on the light, you will not see darkness and light try to fight over who gets control of the room, okay? <laughs> if it is light in here as it is now, and I go, and I get train loads of darkness, right? I, put, I fill duffel bags up with darkness, and I unzip it, and I go, ha! <laughs> Nothing happens, right? Because it's not a power encounter. 
It's a truth encounter. Truth sets people free, right? So let me ask you a couple, a couple questions, all right? Are you born again? Yes. yes. Is that true? Yes. That is true. Are you blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places? Yes. yes. Is that true? Yes. Will you lay the hands on, on them that are sick and will they recover? Is that true? Yes. In the name of Jesus Christ, it is true, all right? So I'm going to close in prayer. We're going to do the thing. I love you guys. And uh, that's what I have to share. Heavenly Father God, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, you are good. Father, we thank you so much for what you're doing. Uh, Dad, we thank you for your provision of deliverance in all ways. Father, we discern the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. You've made it to work in tandem, Dad. And we love you so much. We ask you to be here. And we know that you are. You have never left us. You will never forsake us. We thank you, Father. And we ask you to lead those who need ministering. And these, those who you want to minister in the right way, to the right places, to the right people, all in you and all into glory to you. In Jesus Christ's name, we pray. Amen. Amen. We pray.